Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the second trailer for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. We noticed tons of little details in this trailer that give hints about the movie's plot and Namor's movie origin. And we also got lots of theories about how this connects to Avengers Endgame and how there might be a hidden villain who is not appearing anywhere in this trailer. Is it Killmonger? Yes. The trailer does hint at Killmonger's return, which I'll go over in just a little bit. I'm glad to be back. Where from? Did you go to the bathroom? No, I was go You know what? Never mind. Let's break down this trailer. We open with the Marvel Studios logo as silver on black, which you know what they've been doing a lot lately with various properties. They have Moon Knight, She-Hulk, Secret Invasion, Werewolf by Night. They've all gotten various title remakes just for the trailers. The next shot is of T'Challa's original Black Panther mask from Captain America Civil War before it was replaced with the vibranium nanotech in Black Panther. Shuri is holding the mask at T'Challa's funeral procession, which is probably a ceremonial thing for her to do as she is the next of kin. But it could also be sentimental of her to do this because she worked on so many improvements to her brother's suit over the years. Of course, this is also foreshadowing the end of the trailer when we see that Shuri has indeed carried on the Black Panther mantle from her brother. Are we like 100% sure that's Shuri and not like, I don't know, like Nakia? Yeah, man, I think so. I mean, it's definitely a woman. And she also has these dots on her face that are like the ceremonial dots that Shuri wore during the combat ceremony. And also, you know, here's the poster. Oh. Yeah, but look, more on the new Black Panther later. Ramonda holds on to Shuri and we can see the Kamoyo beads on her wrist. Angela Bassett's going to have a much larger role in this movie, as Ramonda steps into the role of Queen Regent, ruling until the new ruler is chosen through ritual combat. The music in the trailer is Never Forget by Sampa the Great. The title can also be referring to our memory of the late Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa, but it can also mean the pride of the African people. The lyrics speak about how their achievements and movements help shape society today. We fade from the funeral of T'Challa, the fallen king, to Namor, a king who is on the rise. We learned a lot about Namor in this trailer, and we're going to break down all of the Mesoamerican gods and symbolism that are being used to define who this new iteration of the character is. His origin and story are going to be very different and a little more nuanced in the movie than they are in the comics. In the comics, he's half human, half Atlantean, can breathe underwater, and leads the technological advanced undersea kingdom of Atlantis. Like Aquaman, king of the Brotion. Exactly, and too much like Aquaman, even though, I just gotta say, Namor the Submariner, been around longer than Aquaman. So, this movie has taken this basic premise of Namor and applied Mesoamerican myths in the same way that Wakanda's tribes combine different African cultures in the first movie. So in this movie, Namor's culture is a combination of various civilizations that existed in the region that we call Mesoamerica, which is composed of Central America and a good part of Mexico. This is where the Mayans ruled for roughly 2,000 years and where the Aztecs built a sprawling civilization in the middle of the second millennium. Now it seems like in the MCU, the gods worshipped by the Aztecs and the Mayans were real, just like Thor, Bast, various Egyptian gods we see in Moon Knight, and of course, Zeus. Don't talk back to Zeus. So what this movie is actually setting up is two vast, advanced, hidden civilizations that are powered by the energy of their gods, and I think maybe powered by vibranium, but more on that in just a second. The undersea kingdom in this movie is called Talokan. Now this is based on Tlalokan, which in the Aztec culture was the first of 13 afterlives. This afterlife was reserved for people who died from drowning. Now we did a whole video that explained how, if Killmonger is going to return, that this is a perfect opportunity for him. Remember what he insisted they do with his body at the end of Black Panther. Bury me in the ocean. Because he wanted to live with his enslaved ancestors who jumped from the ships on the way to America. Now, Killmonger could have survived his chest stabbing. After all, you know, heart-shaped herb, advanced healing. This didn't kill T'Challa, and Killmonger's spirit could have been delivered to Talo Khan, where he was nursed back to health or even resurrected. In any case, Talo Khan is now a kingdom that Namor is ruling in the movies. And Baku tells us how the people see Namor. They called him Kukul Khan. Okay, so look, in the comics, Namor was not a god to his people. He was actually kind of an outcast. His pink skin and winged feet and half-breed nature made him an outcast at the royal court. I love the change that they've made here, though, that to these undersea people, Namor's differences are something that heralds him to be the second coming of their god. Yeah, and is this like a real god they think he is? Well, it's as real as any gods in the MCU. Kuku Khan is a Mayan god, a feathered serpent very similar to the Aztec god, Quetzalcoatl. And there's actually some scholarly debate on whether or not these are the same deities. Now this is where it gets interesting. Kuku Khan is a creator god, the god of wind, rain, storms, and life. And there is still a standing temple to this deity in Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula. That's in modern day Mexico and parts of Guatemala and Belize. The artifacts found in this temple are very similar to the mural that we see Namor drawing. So it's likely he's painting a mural of the deity that his people seem to think he's the incarnation of. But the Yucatan Peninsula is also famous for another historical event. The meteor that killed the dinosaurs landed here 
here 66 million years ago. And you know that anytime a meteorite lands in the MCU, it's got something special inside of it from space, like vibranium. Or, or a baby celestial. Exactly. Or maybe, in this case, another valuable mineral, adamantium. That's right, now that the X-Men film rights belong to Disney, we're slowly getting the introduction of X-Men related properties. There's Professor X in Multiverse of Madness, <laughs> Ms. Marvel being a mutant, and this article in She-Hawk that's a hint about Wolverine that talks about a man with metal claws getting into a bar fight. Get out of my bar, freak. Wolverine's skeleton is laced with adamantium, and Namor's city of Talokan could be built on a deposit of adamantium. See, the world governments are now realizing that Wakanda has a monopoly on the strongest mineral on Earth, and they would be after something that's almost as powerful as vibranium, adamantium. I'm going to dive into that way deeper later on when we do a lot of plot theorizing. Now, back to the feathered serpent god Kukul Khan. This is a feathered serpent who, like Namor, exists in three worlds, the land, the sky, and the sea. So, this god had a dual nature, just like Namor, who in the comics had a mother from the ocean and a father from the land. Kukul Khan is also what's known as a vision serpent, a god that is a gateway to the spirit realm. These visions are how gods and ancestors revealed themselves to mortal men. Or oh, just like how in the Rock and in afterlife, people always get to meet their cat daddies? That's exactly right. So I think that Bast and Kuku Khan are both very real deities. Or it may turn out that they are in fact the same deity who manifested itself differently to two different cultures. And hey, by the way, you never told me welcome back. From what? Did you go through number five? Five? What's that? Three runs and a two. No, dude, I was going for like two weeks. No, you weren't. Yes, I was. I was in Italy. Nah, -uh. you had a marathon of Il Postino, Life is Beautiful, and The Godfather, and you fell asleep. I knew I should wake you up, but you look so peaceful. So I wasn't on vacation? Vacation from what? Talking about movies? Wait, so the guest hosts, Brian Silliman and Colton Ogburn, they weren't real? Oh, they were real, and they did an amazing job. So how? Moving on. Yep, moving on. So, Namor is painting a mural in what looks like a place hidden from the outside world. We can see caverns outside leading to a pool. Now, this could be one of the Mesoamerican temples that I mentioned earlier. After all, the artwork is very much of that era. But it's interesting that this is a mural that he is seemingly working on for himself. We've seen that the undersea people need to wear a breathing apparatus outside of water. So presumably, Namor is special to them because he can live on the surface. So this mural exists in a place where his people can't actually see it without wearing their breathing gear. Now we do see the hand of someone with blue skin, who I'm guessing is wearing one of these breathing apparatuses. And the paints are being held in a conch-like shell. The conch itself was famously used as a symbol of leadership in William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Whoever held the conch was deemed as leader of the Island of Castaway Boys. <laughs> Now, the conch is a symbol known for being a horn, and horns are used by leaders in cultures to call their people together. <laughs> But, in this case, the horn is being used to paint. What I'm guessing is the serpent god Namor's people draw their power from. Another way of rallying his kind together. Now, this cavern could be in relation to the Kukulkan Seinote in the Yucatan, which is located about two hours from Chichen Itza. Now, a Seinote is a type of underwater sinkhole primarily found in Latin America. The Kukulkan Seinote has a place where fresh water and salt water meet. This causes light effects, which could explain the spotlight effect seen when Namor is descending to his throne. It would also be another symbol of Namor's dual nature. Now, I am very curious about Namor's origin in this movie. In the previous trailer, we saw him being born and then saw him as a child in front of a burning house on the shore. My guess at the time was that he was raised on the surface in his early childhood and then later returned to the sea. In the comics, Namor's dual nature makes him mentally unbalanced, so he has long stretches where he just flat out becomes a villain for a while. So his painting is intercut with another ceremonial tradition the Wakandan funeral dance. Notice that the people here seem to be happy because in Wakanda, death is just a step on their journey. Death is not the end. It's more of a stepping off point. That speech also gives me Gandalf vibes. Death is just another path. One that we all must take. Hey, I thought we were talking about Black Panther, not Rings of Power. I'm sorry, there's just, there's a lot of things right now. So the dance likely takes place in Necropolis, where the kings and queens of Wakanda are laid to rest. Here we see a symbol that probably represents the great mound of vibranium connecting the various tribes of the nation. The statue of a queen wears ceremonial dress very similar to Ramonda's, and the king looks very much like the first Wakandan that Bast showed to the heart-shaped herb, making him the first Wakandan king and the first Black Panther. Now we fade from the funeral to the mural once again to reinforce that there is a new 
king, a new power in this world. Now here, the images on the right look like Mayan tattoos. Mayans did this to try to please their gods by getting their myths carved into their skin, similar to Namor honoring the gods by inscribing their myths on his walls. Then they fade from the mural to Shuri because she is the one who is about to paint a new history for Wakanda. Now there is lots of room for running symbolism between these two nations. The pivotal battles in the first Black Panther movie took place at the edge of a waterfall, a place where the land meets the sea that is also high in the sky. In the comics, Namor is often angered when humans throw pollutants into the sea. And in this movie, I think he'll have a similar motivation and he'll believe that he is serving his god by attacking Wakanda. All right, so then we see Namor descending into a throne built from the jaws of a great fish. Now, at first, I just assumed this was a shark, but now we have another theory. What if this is the jaws of a Mayan god or of a prehistoric monster who lived in those times? This could be a representation of the serpent god Kuku Khan. And since Namor is the spirit or reincarnation of the god, he sits within its jaws. Or it could just be a shark mouth. Yes, and sharks are often found in Mayan art where they appear stylized and exaggerated. They were hunted for Mayans for their livers and teeth because they could not be scavenged post-mortem. Shark teeth have been found with buried offerings to the gods. The shark teeth could depict Namor's strength as a hunter or point to the amounts of offerings left to him. And this also relates to the Love and Thunder's discussion of god offerings. Suffering for your gods is your only purpose. And by the way, Kuku Khan and other Mayan gods actually do exist within Marvel Comics in a group called the Ajaw. Now the teeth are actually very interesting. When we see them a little bit later, we see that they are shiny and metal. They could be made of adamantium, or maybe Talakan is secretly sitting on top of the world's only other source of vibranium. Just a bit later in the trailer, we see humans on a ship launching some sort of undersea expedition. We even see people in diving suits that do not look at all like Wakandan tech. They could be mining under the ocean for another source of vibranium to combat the Wakanda monopoly. In fact, this could have set off the undersea earthquakes that Okoyo detected and then dismissed in Avengers Endgame. Net. It's an earthquake under the ocean. We handle it by not handling it. Now it turns out that earthquake had huge consequences for her people. And maybe if Shuri or T'Challa were around, they would have detected the danger. So mining vibranium disrupts this undersea civilization, so they hijack this ship. What makes you think they hijack the ship? Because later on in the trailer, we see the Jabari fighting Talakanians on the deck of a ship just like this. Okay then. Now, I'm not sure why Wakanda ends up bearing the brunt of the blame for this undersea mining. This doesn't seem like a Wakandan ship. My guess is that these two kingdoms are going to be pitted against one another by some unseen villain. Who's that? Well, Doug, I think you and I know there's only one villain who could possibly manipulate the hearts of the world governments, an undersea kingdom, and the Wakandans. And I am talking about... Err, uh, don't say it. Mephisto! Not the beast! Hey, that's a cool shirt. Where'd you get that? Oh, you like it? This shirt is actually available at our merch store, which is a great way for you to help support our channel. At the Screen Crush merch store, we have lots of high quality tees, including this limited edition original trilogy t-shirt. And now we're ramping up and adding new products all of the time, including this Not The Bee shirt. So check out the shop and other great gear at shopzeroedition.com slash screencrush or go to screencrush.com and click on shop. Okay, but take that shirt off because it's not casual Fridays. You got it. Back to the trailer, as Namor lowers his spear, we cut to Okoye setting her spear into the ground in the throne room. She'll have an interesting journey in this movie. She failed in her one duty to protect her king, and now she will have to help rebuild her nation afterwards. Gonna talk a lot more about her arc in a bit when we are introduced to a new key member of the Dora Milaje. The throne room is adorned with Wakandan writing that reads, An honor, Da forever, probably short for Wakanda forever, rest in power, and King T'Challa. Next, we see the Wakandan ships carrying large crates into the Jabari borderlands, where M'Baku holds a meeting of exposition. They call him Kukul Khan, the Feather Serpent God. Now, this meeting has a lot of VIPs. Okoye, and who I think is Nakia here. In the previous trailer, we saw M'Baku fighting Namor on the shores of Wakanda, which is why I think that his tribe stormed the hijacked ship. Maybe they took Namor prisoner and he's located inside one of these flying crates, which is why they are debating now what to do with him. If they kill him, they risk eternal war, very similar to the permanent bad blood between Wakanda and Atlantis in the comics, where each nation has killed countless members of the other. T'Challa even swore a blood elf to his ancestors to kill Namor. Or maybe they're all up there to hide from the sea people because it's far from water. Well, it could be, but then again, they did hide in the borderlands in the last movie. So I doubt it. It could be, though. This discussion of Namor being like a god does make me think that we will see a much more supernatural aspect to this movie, that the gods Bast and Kuku Khan will go head to head. In the comics, Shuri does go through a long spiritual journey in another realm. And in the last trailer, Ramonda said, And my entire family is gone! 
So maybe in the movie, Shuri is lost in the spirit realm, where she goes on a personal journey to learn about the gods, which makes her ready to become Black Panther. And like, look, how the heck did they make Namor's stupid little winged feet look good? He should, by all rights, be the silliest live action character of all time. But I am terrified of this man and his four itty bitty little wings. He's flying above Wakanda, and I think this is moments before this shot, when Ramonda and Riri Williams look out the window of the throne room and see him in the reflection of the glass. Now we see Namor raising his spear here to shatter the glass, and later we see the throne room being flooded like the elevators in The Shining. Next we see soldiers storming into a Wakandan lab. Now, I think this lab is one of the Wakandan outreach centers that Shuri was running at the end of the first Black Panther, and that this one is located in Chicago, hometown of Riri Williams, who's going to be the star of the show Ironheart. More on her in just a bit. At this lab, we see Michaela Cole's character Anika, who is disguised as one of the scientists. My guess is that she is an undercover Dora here. In the comics, Anika and her fellow Dora Milaje, Ayo, fall in love, and Ayo saves Anika from a death sentence. The two then steal experimental blue Dora Milaje armor and go around defeating local warlords, forming an actual kind of rebellion against the throne. Following T'Challa's death, I think we'll see a lot of unrest like this within Wakanda's borders, as outside governments are trying to take advantage of a nation in mourning to seize their technology at these various outreach centers. Now we see a bit more of the boat attack, with views from a helicopter pad and from underneath, and in the previous trailer, we even saw them using a whale as transport. I think this sequence is likely to be the opening of the movie, a kind of origin story for Namor that ends with his people striking first against the surface world. And so then, when the world's governments can no longer get vibranium from the ocean, they start to seize it from remote Wakandan labs like the one in Chicago. Now we see more of the Chicago fight with Okoye and the other Dora fighting soldiers. And she shoves her spear through what looks like a Dodge Charger, maybe Camaro? Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. And then I'm guessing that she uses the spear's concussion blast to knock over this cop car, though the CGI for the blast is not done in the trailer. The license plate here says EE710, probably standing for Easter egg. Now, the 710 could be a reference to Black Panther Volume 7, Issue 10, which did feature the Egyptian god pantheon, the Ennead, which we saw in Moon Knight. The super group of Egyptian gods, you know, you've got Horus, Osiris, Tefnut, oh, Shu. Stop. Or it's a reference to Jungle Action Issue 7, Number 10, where T'Challa fights a kingdom of undead underground minions beneath Wakanda, just as this movie is going to show a threat emerging from the waters beneath Wakanda. Now, all of this taking place in Chicago makes me think this is the origin story for Riri Williams. In the comics, she was a kid from Chicago and lost her stepdad and best friend in a drive-by shooting. She is one of the smartest people on Earth and built her own prototype Iron Man suit when she was 15 years old. When Tony Stark was in a coma, he made an AI hologram of himself to tutor her as a new hero, Ironheart, who replaced him until he got better. Later, we see her building a suit in a Wakandan lab, judging by this floor tile. And the suit looks like it's made out of car parts. Maybe the car that Okoyo is escaping in from Chicago. This could also be a suit that Riri assembles at the Chicago lab, just like how in the comics, she made her first suit at MIT's lab. We first see her Ironheart suit flying here. Now, I'm guessing that while Shuri is on her spirit quest, Riri fills in as the resident genius for the nation. We get other similarities to Tony Stark, like her using a blowtorch and creating her iron heart with a hammer like we saw in the last trailer. And we get a great look at Namor staring down Ramonda on a beach. And I love the costume details here. Gold shells around his neck along with pearls. It's nice to see pearls in a comic book movie that aren't flying off a dying woman. And earlier we saw that his gauntlets appeared to be covered in scales. So we see Ramonda at the UN, probably the same scene from the last trailer where she admonishes the world governments for trying to take advantage of Wakanda's weaknesses. Next we see several shots of Wakandans drowning in a flood, a heartbreak breaking image taken from Namor's attack in the comics, including the flooding of the Wakandan throne room. This shot is Namor fighting someone or attacking a console inside a Wakandan ship, making me think that if they did capture him, he was captured on purpose. No way, just like Loki and the Joker and the bad guy in Skyfall and Seven and Silent- I get it, it's a trope. Moving on, Shuri crying, being comforted by M'Baku, and Namor fighting off Wakandan tech from the shore fight that we saw in the last trailer. Now, here we see who I think could be a sub-antagonist in this movie. This is Atuma, played by Alex Ovalani. Atuma is Namor's chief nemesis in the comics. He's a power-hungry Atlantean, a worshiper of the god Set, who is always trying to conquer Atlantis or the surface world. In this movie, he could be the one who is prodding Namor into war with Wakanda. And maybe if Namor sues for peace, Atuma will lead the other Atlanteans into defiance of his wishes. Or if the Wakandans do take Namor prisoner, Atuma could use this as a point to leverage power in his place. And here we see Nakia in blue armor, very similar to the blue armored suits that Ao and Anika wear in the comics. Maybe Nakia takes on one of those roles. 
existing outside of the Wakandan power structure, someone who's not subject to the authority of the throne, but is still on the side of good. Now, I personally thought she should have been the new Black Panther, but whatever. One of the most epic shots in these trailers is Shuri in a flooded throne room watching flames crawl up the sides. This is, of course, evocative of Killmonger burning the heart-shaped herb in the first movie, a symbol that the old regime was being burned away to make way for his reign. Hey, how'd the fish people make that water burn? What is this, Cleveland? Well, Doug, I actually think that this is not happening in reality, that this scene is part of Shuri's long vision quest in the spirit realm. Maybe she ends up going into the spirit world to find T'Challa, but instead she finds herself. And the text here says, sacred ground may we find and wisdom of our ancestors. And of course, the trailer ends with a scene that parallels T'Challa's first fight in the movie Black Panther, dropping from the Millennium Falcon-like drop hole into battle, where he totally freezes. What are you talking about? I never freeze. Except now, it is a female Black Panther who has the exact same ceremonial face markings that Shuri had during the final battle of Black Panther, implying this is what she wears when she goes into battle. And if it's not Shuri, then somebody sure did steal her look. And there's only one person in these films who would do that, and that is your mom. And when she lands, you can even see the purple vibranium energy coursing through the suit. Wait a minute. The nanites absorb the kinetic energy and hold it in place for redistribution. And to be honest, I'm kind of bummed they revealed this in the trailer because I thought it would have been like a neat surprise for the movie. But hopefully the movie is so good that the reveal doesn't even matter. Well, let me know your thoughts on this. Do you want Shuri to be the new Black Panther? Let me know in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.